Sir, sir, can we start? Okay, if yeah, please start. So we take room for that. Oh. সবচেয়ে আগে সমিতা শুভ নববর্ষ আন্তরিক অভিনন্দন তোমাকে তার কারণ তুমি আমাদের আমন্ত্রণ আগ্রহে গ্রহণ করেছো আমি বহুদিন ধরে চেষ্টা করছি তোমাকে আনার যে কোনো কারণে হয়ে ওঠেনি আর আমাদের মহিলা সংগঠন থেকে যখন তোমার কাছে অনুরোধ গেল তখন তুমি প্রতি সত্তর তোমার মত দিয়েছিলে তার মানে মহিলা সংগঠনের প্রতি তোমার দুর্বলতা অনেক অনেক বেশি তো যাই হোক আমি খুব খুশি যে একজন পুরনো বান্ধবীকে পাচ্ছে আমাদের মধ্যে যে বান্ধবী শুধুমাত্র কেমব্রিজ বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ের অধ্যাপক তাই নয় সে আমাদের খুব কাছের লোক বিশ্বভারতীর কাছের লোক আমারও খুব কাছের 
এবং সবচেয়ে যেটা গুরুত্বপূর্ণ বিষয় যে এমন একটা বিষয় নিয়ে সমিতা আজকে বলবে আমি খানিক জানতে পারলাম সেই বিষয়টার অনেকটা কাজ আমাদের এই বীরভূম জেলার দারুন্দা গ্রামে হয়েছে এবং আমাদের সহকর্মিনী মহুয়া এর সঙ্গে যুক্ত ছিল তো সমিতা সত্যি খুব আনন্দিত যে তুমি এমন একটা বিষয়ের উপর বলবে আজকে যে বিষয়টার সঙ্গে আমাদের একটা আত্মিক যোগাযোগ আছে অর্থাৎ দারুন্দা জায়গাটা আমি চিনি কারণ আমার মাসির বাড়ি ওখানে আমি ওই জায়গাটা সম্বন্ধে পরিচিত ভোল সম্বন্ধে পরিচিত আর সমিত সম্বন্ধে বলবো কি সমিত সম্বন্ধে যা পরিচয় দেওয়ার আমাদের সহকর্মী দেবে তবে আজকের এই দোসরা বৈশাখ সমিতার যে লেকচারটা সেই লেকচারটা আমরা শুধুমাত্র মহিলা সংগঠনের তরফ থেকে করছি তা নয় সমিতা তুমি হয়তো জানো না আমি এখানে যোগদান করার পর আমি শুরু করেছি একটা লেকচার সিরিজ ইউনিভার্সিটি লেকচার সিরিজ সেই লেকচার সিরিজে শুরু হয়েছিল দু হাজার উনিশ সালের জানুয়ারি মাসে এবং লেকচার সিরিজের প্রথম লেকচারটা দেন তোমারই একজন পুরনো সহকর্মী অধ্যাপক দিলীপ চক্রবর্তী তিনি সেই লেকচারটা দেন তারপরে আমরা অনেককেই পেয়েছি যেমন খুব শীঘ্রই আমাদের দিয়েছেন প্রফেসর ব্রায়ান হাচার যিনি টাপস ইউনিভার্সিটি বিদ্যাসাগর উপর ভালো কাজ করেছেন লর্ড ভিকু পারেক উনি বলেছেন এই লেকচার সিরিজে লর্ড মেঘনাথ দেশাই বলেছেন এই লেকচার সিরিজে এবং এছাড়া অনেকেই যারা পরিচিত তাদের নিজের কার্যের মাধ্যমে তারা অনেকেই দিয়েছেন এবং আগামী সপ্তাহে আমাদের বলছেন প্রফেসর অরবিন্দ অরবিন্দ পানাগারিয়া এরা এরা বলছেন তারপর বদ্রি নারায়ণ তিওয়ারি ও বলছেন তো ইত্যাদি সেজন্য আমরা খুব খুবই গর্বিত যে এই এমন লেকচার সিরিজে তোমারকে আমরা যুক্ত করতে পারলাম তোমার মতো ইলাস্ট্রিয়াস ঐতিহাসিক কে আমরা যুক্ত করতে পারলাম তার প্রফেশনাল দিকটা যাই থাক না কেন সবিতা খুব বড় মাপের মানুষ আমি জাস্ট সবিতা যদি আপত্তি না থাকে আমি একটা ব্যক্তিগত অভিজ্ঞতা বলি কেমব্রিজে আমি যখন ছিলাম এজ এ ফেলো অ্যাট রুপসন কলেজ সবিতা তখন ট্রিনিটির ফেলো সবিতার বাড়ির পাশে গ্রিন স্ট্রিট থাকতো তার বাড়ির পাশে সেন্সবেরি তো সেন্সবেরিতে বাজার করতে গেলে ফেরার সময় আমরা কোনোদিনই না খেয়ে ফিরতাম না মানে বলা হতো সমিতার বাড়িটা হচ্ছে সরাইখানা যে কে আসছে কে যাচ্ছে কে খাচ্ছে এটার ব্যাপারে কখনোই আমরা সমিতা কখনই খেয়াল করতো না আমরা যেতাম বাড়িতে ঢুকতাম খাওয়া দাওয়া হতো হঠাৎ সমিতা সন্ধ্যাবেলায় এসে হাজির হয়ে গেল বা সমিতা অনেক সময় নিজেও রান্না বান্না করে বহুবার খাইয়েছে তা আমাদের কেমব্রিজের যে ভারতীয় ছাত্র ছাত্রী এবং কিছু অভারতীয় ছাত্র ছাত্রী ছিল তাদের কেন্দ্রবিন্দু যদি বলি সমিতা ছিল এবং সমিতা রাগ করো না সমিতাকে কেমব্রিজে বলা বলা হতো গ্র্যান্ড মা মানে সমিতা সবাইকে টানতে পারতো সবিতা কিন্তু এই বিরাট একটা গুণ আছে তো গ্রিন স্ট্রিটের যে ফ্ল্যাটটা সবিতা থাকতো সেই ফ্ল্যাটে কেমব্রিজে গেছে অত সমিতার ফ্ল্যাটে কেউ যায়নি এটা হতেই পারে তো সেই জন্য সমিতার কিন্তু এই গুণটা আছে আমি সমিতাকে ঐতিহাসিক হিসাবে যতটা দেখি তার থেকে অনেক বড় দেখি অনেক বড় মাপের মানুষ যে মানুষ কিন্তু আজকাল দিনে পাওয়া খুব অসম্ভব এবং ওর সঙ্গে যোগাযোগ আমার আছে এখনো খুব ব্যস্ত হয়ে পড়েছে যার জন্য সেরকম যোগাযোগ রেগুলার যোগাযোগ নেই তবে একাডেমিক ব্যাপার আলোচনা প্রায়ই হয় কথাবার্তা প্রায়ই হয় এবং আমি আজকে খুব গর্বিত এবং খুব আনন্দিত যে আমাদের মহিলা সংগঠনের ডাকে সমিতা সাড়া দিয়েছে এবং সমিতা এমন একটা বক্তব্য বিষয় নিয়ে বলবে যে বক্তব্য বিষয়টা কিন্তু আমাদের দারুন্দা থেকে অনেকটাই তুমি ডেটা পেয়েছ তো এই বক্তব্য বলে আমি সমিতাকে আবার ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি আন্তরিক ধন্যবাদ মানে এটা ফর্মালিটি নয় সত্যি অন্তর থেকে একজন বন্ধু তার বান্ধবীকে ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছে এবারে তোমার যে প্রফেশনাল পরিচয়টা দেওয়ার জন্য আমি জানি বিপাশে কে দেবে এটা তরুশ্রীকে অনুরোধ করব ওকে ফর্মালি ইন্ট্রোডিউস করে ওর বক্তৃতা শুরু করো আমাদের ফর্ম্যাটটা আছে তুমি তোমার মতো করে বলবে তারপরে প্রশ্ন উত্তর আমরা চ্যাট বক্সে নেব তারপরে তোমাকে প্রশ্ন জানানো হবে এবং প্রশ্নের উত্তর তুমি দেবে যতক্ষণ তুমি চাইবে ততক্ষণ চলবে তুমি যখন বলবে না আই এম টায়ার্ড সো উইল স্টপ দেন ঠিক আছে আর মিডিয়ামটা আমি বাংলায় বললাম ইচ্ছা করি তুমি ইংরেজিতেও বলতে পারো বাংলাতেও বলতে পারো থার্ড অফ ফেব্রুয়ারি 
is an association of the female staff members of Vishu Bharati and aims to enhance work life at the university by providing congenial circumstances in which women members can participate in social, intellectual, and cultural activity. While we have organized several programs since our inception, such as wellness camp for female employees, book exhibition, cultural programs, and so forth, this is our first endeavor to organize an academic session, and we feel privileged to have with us Professor Shomita Shen today to mark the first academic lecture organized by Women's Association in collaboration with Bishubharati lecture series. For the latter, Professor Sen's talk marks the 31st lecture. It is indeed a moment of great honor for me to be getting this opportunity to introduce Professor Somita Sen today. Professor Sen is Vera Hemsmark Professor in Imperial and Naval History at the University of Cambridge. She was the first Vice Chancellor Diamond Harbor University, West Bengal. She has taught in the universities of Calcutta and Jadupur. Her monograph on women's employment in the jute industry in colonial Bengal was published in 1999 and won the Trevor Rees Prize in Commonwealth history. She is at present working on women's migration and history of marriage. She has published papers on education, women's movement, religious conversion, informal labor, and domestic violence. She has participated in action research on gender budgeting, women in governance, and women's land rights. Her recent publications include a jointly written book on women domestic workers titled Domestic Days 2016 and edited translations of three tracts on Assam tea plantations titled Passage to Bondage 2016. Love, Labor and Law Early and Child Marriage in India co-edited with Anindita Ghosh is published by Sage India. It has just come out in January 2021. The title of her today's talk is a new girlhood child marriage in West Bengal. In the end, I would like to add that Professor Sen is not only one of the finest academicians, but also a great mentor. I have had the privilege of working in close association with Professor Shomita Shen on several occasions for the development of the Women's Studies Center at Vishu Bharati. She has always offered her cordial support to us with her warm welcoming smile whenever we at the center needed advice and guidance. I shall always cherish my association with Professor Shen and our centers shall remain ever grateful to you, ma'am, for your contributions. Lastly, I would like to apologize on behalf of Professor Shobhita Pradhan, President and Professor Gita Kini, Secretary of Women's Association, for not being able to attend today's lecture because they are on election duties at the moment. With these few words, I request Professor Shen to deliver her talk. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be back, even if virtually in the in that library space, which I remember from many previous um, talks and conferences. I would I do have a PPT, so can I share my screen? Yeah. Yes, please, Shamita, you can. Yes, can you see it now? Yeah. Yes, yes, we can see. Great. Great. Okay, so let me uh, preface this um, by saying uh, what you have both already mentioned, that uh, part of this work was done uh, in Darunda, of course, as well, but in three village clusters in Birbhum, very close to Vishwa Bharati, um, um, uh, in addition to many other districts. Um, and uh, so in a sense, that association was alive in my mind uh, when I chose to uh, speak on this subject uh, today. Uh, the previous director of the Women's Studies Center of Vishwa Bharati, Dr. De now Professor Dipita Chakraborty, was very much part of this project. So this project and this work uh, remains associated in my mind with the center, with the Women's Studies Center and with Shantini Ketan and Vishwa Bharati. I should also say that my association with Shantini Ketan is not uh, a, only an academic one. It's very much a familial one. I have grown up uh, spending my vacations, school vacations in Shantiniketan. 
So it is always a great pleasure and many fond memories are associated with any uh, event I attend at Shantini Ketan. Unfortunately, I can't go um, and this is virtual, uh, but nevertheless, it is a great pleasure. Um, the project itself was called Love, Labor and Law. And this um, ed edited volume in which Dipita has an essay uh, was published earlier this year. Um, and um, much of what I will say today um, is there in various essays uh, in the book, though not all of it is. Um, now, the study itself, uh, the, the, the seven districts are given on the slide. I won't read it out. Um, there are many aspects of this study, and I will not today uh, talk about um, uh, much of uh, the project itself. I will focus only on one key finding of the project, which relates to the question of girlhood. Now we take for granted that the child, the terms child, the girl, the girl child, these seem to us very obvious descriptions. They relate to facts, you know, the children are children, they grow up. Um, but in fact, the idea of the child or the girl um, is in fact a historical, uh, is a category and there is a history of the emergence of this category. In very recent years, uh, Ashwini Tambe uh, has published a book in which she has explored the emergence of the term girl child and its internationalization through the agency of the UN. Her key argument is that unlike many terms which come to India through the UN from the West, the term girl child actually traveled from India to the West. So why is it that this should happen? It is counterintuitive that in India, the, the idea of the girl child uh, came into uh, uh, fruition because the question of the girl in the Indian context is in fact quite fraught. The girl child is usually defined as below 10 years. And there, is, there are stories of sex ratio, um, feticide, um, the missing women, Allah Amartya Sen, which is associated with the uh, use of this, this term. Um, but beyond 10 years, the girl, the girl, it's no longer girl child, uh, but only girl. And this term has not had that much currency in the Indian context. What is how do we think of the girl? What is the history of the emergence of the girl? And this is critical. Why I focus on this is because in an earlier time, there would be no girl. There would be a girl child, perhaps. Um, and then she would be, from being a girl child, she would be married. In the 19th century, the British spoke of infant marriage. Females were infants then there were married women. There is no in-between period when we can think of a girl. So there is no adolescence for girls. Since marriage was at puberty and after marriage, women are deemed to be women, adults. Me marriage in fact is the key transition from childhood to adulthood. We can discuss this a little more if people are interested when we uh, do the discussion. I will now move. Uh, because uh, the, the absence of, of the girl is evident in many sites uh, in the 19th and early 20th century. I have looked at uh, labor laws, for instance. If you look at the factory laws, there is adolescence always means boys. At the turn of the century, Beginning from America, there was an internationalization of the idea of the adolescent. 
And this was framed what is now called in terms of bi biology, the, the idea and the study, the focus on boys. And this, the boy was an adolescent boy. The girl was a child, the boy was an adolescent. And there was, so the, the, the girl child did not become the adolescent girl. The crux of what I'm saying is that the adolescent girl is a new social category in India. It is the slow upward creep of the age of marriage, which is highly differentiated by rural urban class caste, that the notion of girls, that of adolescent girls or young women has arisen. To repeat, the decline of child marriage has given rise to the emergence of this new social category. That child marriage has moved from becoming a problem of the elite to the problem of the poor is, an, is a key element of this transition. It has, child marriage was at one time a crisis of culture. Today, it is an issue of development. This shift from culture to development is a very important new framing of the issue in the ways it intersects with the two main elements that define childhood, work and education. Now, there is a huge class lag in the way this has historically evolved. For the middle class, the transition from child to adult marriage happened between late 19th century and mid 20th century. For the poor, this transition is still taking place, perhaps accelerated at the turn of the 21st century. Research is very thin on this, so we don't know how far adult marriages gave way to child marriage at the turn of the 20th century. So we are not sure whether this, this is a two-stage transition or not, uh, but we can discuss this more um, later when we have the discussion session. Now, to approach child marriage, uh, from the perspective of decline is also counterintuitive. No one in fact studies the decline of child marriage. It is generally agreed that the chief problem of child marriage is its persistence. Despite the concerted efforts of states, national and international agencies, this is a problem that has stubbornly resisted eradication. And it is assumed that, in fact, child marriage should be eradicated. It should naturally wither away uh, by processes of modernization and development. And this framing of the problem has therefore quite um, obscured the equally remarkable fact that while child marriage persists, it has also declined. And what is really important in this is that the pattern has changed. First, infant marriage of, uh, if we define infant marriage as marriage below the age of 12, is no longer common. The numerically largest component of legally defined child marriage is teenaged marriage between the age of 15 and 17. Many observers have opted for the term early marriage rather than child marriage to describe this phenomena. The work on which I draw this paper focuses on West Bengal, where the problem of persistence is particularly acute since, as I have said in my previous slide, West Bengal has moved from number seven to number one in the child marriage league table. Um, but uh, so the problem of persistence is particularly acute here, but the change is also very discernible. That is to say the change from um, child to early marriage. In 2016, West Bengal moved 
uh, the incidence of underage marriage in West Bengal has decreased, but at a lower rate than other states. All numbers show, and our study confirms, that in West Bengal also, child marriage now refers to the age group 15 to 18. So there are increasingly larger cohorts of girl below or about 14 years. So if you think of child as below 10, then there is now increasingly an age group of 10 to 15 of girls, who we would call girls, unmarried girls, who are now a new social category. Now, very briefly and quickly, let us look at the rise in the age of marriage. In 2011 in India, average marriage age for men was 26, um, and it was 22.2 for women. The median age of marriage was rising. Yet 61% of all women, 69 in rural and 31 in urban, are married before the age of 16. The e median age at first pregnancy is 19.2 years. West Bengal, as I said, has risen steeply because the uh, risen in the, the ranking of child marriage steeply because the while the incidence of underage marriage has in, decreased, this decrease has been much less than in other states of the country. In West Bengal, the median age of marriage um, is close to the country average, but the number of underage marriage is highest. In 1991, for instance, West Bengal was 19.7 years for women, median age, against all India average of 19.3. But in 1998-99, in rural areas, it was 18.7 against an all India average of 19. And for urban areas, it was 22.4 against an all India average of 21.5, so higher. Now we must look for reasons for these trends, but these are not the, the these trends are not the focus of this presentation. Briefly, our research seeks to link this to lack of employment opportunities. One reason given for general increase in age of marriage is expansion of school education. It is not that West Bengal's performance in this regard is particularly poorer than other states. Where West Bengal has suffered is in a steep industrial decline and a diminution of women's workforce participation. In a state where women's workforce participation rate was already low. I will not labor this point today. We can return to it in, at, 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 at the discussion. Uh, but the general conclusion is now widely recognized. It appears that child marriage is now that of girls between 15 and 18. So there are increasingly larger cohorts of girls below the age of 15 who are now unmarried. Now, there is a strong perception in all the seven areas that we have conducted, districts that we have conducted fieldwork, there is a strong perception that there is a increase in underage elopements. Now, this is something that nobody collects statistics for. There's no agency that um, counts elopements. So it is very difficult to establish and it is impossible to prove. However, it is a shared perception in all the areas, all the villages that we have visited. A few of our respondents said that the, these elopements were uh, also happened earlier, but the rate had increased. Um, there was some disagreement of, over when this increase began. 
when um, uh, some said that this happened, this was in the last two years. So we conducted our field work in 2015. Uh, so this would have been in 2012, 13. There are several directions in which these arguments can go. First, the rise in the age of marriage is itself responsible for the rise in elopements. In a period where girls were married very young, before they could exercise an agency in terms of choice of partners, there is very little scope for elopements. In such situations, married women may have eloped but we have only very episodic information of such incidents. It follows, second, that we need to explore elopements from the perspective of the agency of the marital pair. In a snapshot, because this is not really the subject of um, the discussion today, what can lead to a rise in elopements? Why would there be a um, uh, a uh, uh, higher frequency of elopements. We could think of it as resistance of the young couple against arranged marriages. We can think that this is a socially legitimate channel for expression of adolescent sexual desire. We can think this as a way children, young people curve autonomy from the natal family and rebel against the social restrictions uh, on unmarried women. We can also think in terms of an expansion of the discourse of love and romance and coupledom vis-a-vis -vis earlier Im imageries of gender segregation and gender segregated age hierarchized families where young people accepted the decisions of their parents or older people. But there are two interesting aspects to these elopements that we found in the field. Um, firstly, in West Bengal, there is a huge contrast to the stories we hear from North India. In West Bengal, parents accept elopements. They don't go after eloping couples and they're not you know, strung up on trees and killed and all that. The most parents accept elopements and they even arrange a social marriage with the usual rituals the, and even dowry is sometimes paid uh, in cases of elopements. In a few cases, acceptance may come a little more slowly. Sometimes it comes after the marriage. Sometimes it comes after the first child is born. In most cases, however, there is acceptance. Elopements by unmarried girls are seen as transgressive. They're still seen as transgressive. But they do not carry the same um, social sanction, the same opprobrium as they did earlier. The question then is if it is not transgressive, then why is there a need for elopement? After all, elopement is a risk for young girls. It seems as though there is a tension between arranged marriage and love marriage. In an earlier study, we had seen that a lot of young people, especially in urban areas, especially among the middle classes, accepted arranged marriage, even though there was a strong ideological swing in favor of love. These compromises have sometimes been called arranged love marriages, as Patricia Oberoi has termed it. The process appears somewhat different in rural Bengal. Parents are still committed strongly to arranged marriages and children are using elopements as a way of forcing their parents' hands in terms of allowing them their choice of partners. Is this reflective of a generational tussle that has been made possible by the rise in the age of marriage so girls are a little older and they can make a choice? Once a girl runs away with a man, for the parent, there is very little option but to marry her off to the man. It is difficult to arrange a marriage after an elopement with another man. 
Now, how serious are the implications for this change? We don't know. This is still a very preliminary study, and it would be great if other younger people uh, took this work forward and looked at elopements in more detail. Does it signal a change in perspectives, or is it just an adjustment in the marriage system? Um, this is something that we could discuss more. Parents blame the spread of education, awareness, and exposure for this, um, for elopements, for the fact that there is greater assertiveness on part of young women. Almost all respondents considered the mobile phone responsible for enabling girls to elope. It allowed them to establish contact in a larger social circle, pursue relationships, and coordinate elopements. The mobile phone is blamed both as a cause and a logistic support. Um, I we draw on um, the the um, there's very still very little work on the the impact of the mobile phone, but Jody Dean talks of communicative capitalism um, as a way to think of mobile phones, and we could draw on on those kinds of ideas to look at a, a little more detail of what the mobile phone has done um, in social contexts like this. Um, the mobile phone is, in fact, the focus of considerable generational tension in the village home. I call it the new villain of the village. Um, it may be seen in two ways. First, older respondents, especially those above the age of 30 years, are less comfortable with these gadgets especially women have an indirect relationship with these mobile phones, which they use for some things and depend on for some things, but the young in the family tend to mediate their relationship with the object, with the mobile phone. Given the increasing importance of electronic dissemination of information, this has disrupted traditional knowledge systems and the field of power constructed by it. Simultaneously, the young are able to use these gadgets for use and for access. So parents depend on young people to help them with the technology. And then young people also use the technology for their own purposes. Um, and this is particularly significant for girls. Why? Because adolescent girls are a new social group and they have yet to acquire a social role. <coughs> there is a clear convergence with schooling. You will see the, there is an exactly same age. Girls' dropout rates are highest at class eight when school stops being free. And this is exactly the same age when girls also when age 15, when we see the increase in the rate of marriage. So there is clearly dropping out of school and getting married is connected. Kanyashri may have changed the connection a little bit. We don't know yet. Study needs to be done. See to what extent Kanyashri may have changed the gendered patterns of schooling. Now these girls, if they're withdrawn from school at the age of 15 or thereabouts, they have nothing to do because they had don't, they're not allowed the same freedom as boys. Boys go out of the house, they roam around, they play, they access many kinds of occupations and amusements. The adolescent boy is an accepted social category in the village. By contrast, girls are not allowed to go out of the house. They are expected to share housework with mothers, 
who do often go out to work. They often stay alone at home for long parts of the day. They may look after younger siblings, but with smaller families, this is not as demanding as it used to be earlier. Therefore, TV and mobile phone may be more important to these girls in terms of how they spend their time. What are the alternatives? Apart from if they're not doing education, what could they do? They could, there's no leisure, there's no you know, going out, and there is no education. So the other thing could have been work. There is no work in West Bengal. Uh, they access education as long as it is free, or at least it is heavily subsidized. Then they begin to drop out. Interestingly, there is a perception that higher education is very expensive. In fact, in West Bengal, the public university system is still quite large and it is very cheap. And there are a number of scholarship opportunities, including Kanyashri, but others as well. However, there may be hidden costs um, and uh, uh, a majority of young girls in rural contexts do not aspire to or dream of accessing higher education. So there's no work, there's education is not a possibility. What are they to do? There is one kind of work which is the commonest kind of work in West Bengal and that is paid domestic work. Um, so that is an interesting aside on which we have, I have worked before, so has Dipita. Um, and the connection between paid domestic work and the pattern of marriage is in fact another very interesting subject uh, which we can discuss if you're interested. Now, before I end, I will make two points that are not directly related. One is a point about age. So this entire everything I have said um, um, is based on a, on particular age that you uh, uh, age in years, which is nowadays called digital age, as opposed to chronological age or digital age, as opposed to biological age. So by biological age, you would talk about adolescence at puberty. Uh, but you wouldn't say 15 years. There is much discussion now about the construction of age and modernity. Ishita Pandey's new book on the politics of age and child marriage is a very important contribution in this discussion. Um, I would flag two things about this discussion. First, we should not rush to conclusions about the overlap of chronological age and modernity. We should not assume that there is no chronological age before modernity. This is because we are a land of horoscopes. Um, there is, um, there are aspects of chronological age that our uh, ancient laws, also mention specific age. Um, without modern standardization, this specific age may not mean very much, but as we know, we have had our Nobobor show yesterday. Um, we have traditional pre-colonial calendars and um, chronology is not new. Chronology is neither modern nor Western. So we should be cautious about not thinking not of, of, of our interrogation of the connection between chronological and biological age. In this context, I always like to flag Taslima Nasreen's uh, 2013 book, her memoir, the first volume of her memoir, which she called Amar Mebala. Um, and to a Bengali audience, it is a clear intervention uh, where Mebala, uh, she uses the term Mebala in um, contrast to the word Chelebala. Uh, the fact that Chelebala is a word used to denote childhood for both men and women 
uh, by using a term chele, which is actually for boys, um, has been a very important intervention. Um, and I see that it metaphorically or symbolically almost um, points to the emergence of a new girlhood. The fact that, that there was no uh, girlhood and that there is a need to construct a new girlhood is so poignantly underlined uh, by this title in Taslima Nasreen's book. Um, but even in our ancient uh, uh, um, um, texts and uh, in Sanskrit texts and things, it is not as though there isn't girlhood. Um, I, I can't give you all 16 names, but there are names for girls uh, up to the age of 16, which map with the um, uh, cycle of the moon. Uh, so there are, you know, resources in our tradition as well, which we should explore before we rush to think of everything as modern. The second point I would make is exactly the opposite, which is that as a modern tool of governmentality, age has not been as effective a technology either in colonial or in post-colonial India as one would, as one might imagine. On the one hand, the Indian state has grand visions of new technologies of surveillance. So we have the biometric Aadhaar card. There is so much push from the state to universalize Aadhaar card, to connect it to every facet of our lives. NPR, NRC, CA, there is no end to the way in which our identities are uh, uh, desired by the Indian state to be recorded. And yet the fundamental basis of this is so weak. The registration of births, marriages and deaths is, has never been properly in, implemented in the country. Um, and uh, the will of the state to in fact record this is not clear. Uh, so while we proliferate the technology of age, the, every all our laws, many of our laws have age in number in, in the law, um, and we have different ages for different things, uh, but the determination of the technology which will then enable you to determine people's age, that itself has never been uh, fine-tuned, it's never been implemented. What do you make of this? What is this contradictory um, 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 uh, approach of the Indian state to the question of age? How can you call age a modern technology if in fact it fails? And many people, anybody who's done any field work in Indian countryside will know this, immediately will relate to this. I will tell you two stories which I uh, love telling. One is in one village that we went, a mother and son showed us their Aadhaar cards and they were laughing. Um, the son was older than the mother by the, by the Aadhaar card. Um, and uh, we, so we said, why haven't you corrected it? You can correct the Aadhaar card. They said, why should we correct it? We, it doesn't make any difference to our lives. It's just funny. Um, so that is, you know, the, the irrelevance. Um, of age as a technology, the irrelevance of Aadhaar card uh, to people. The second is the story is of a girl who was married before she was 18. And she told us a long story about how much her, how much money her father had to spend to bribe people to record her age as 18 so that her marriage became valid. So clearly, um, the lack of uh, registration at the right time means that this is an open um, opportunity for um, uh, 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 corrupt practices um, that you know make this whole technology, modern technology of age, quite irrelevant. So this is this is of course this is the defining framework. If you don't have determination of age, then how do you do or how do you implement child marriage laws? and how indeed can you explore notions of um, girlhood. The second 
um, no, un, uh, uh, point I wanted to make was about caste. So elopements and the uh, proliferation of elopements um, in uh, 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 that we have seen in um, uh, all seven districts that we studied. Um, how far are these because young people want to marry out of caste? A lot of it is. There is both inter-caste and inter-community marriages that happen as a result of, by, through the mode of elopement. However, that is, doesn't seem to be the full thrust of the issue. One of the, we had expected caste to be a very important part of the story of child marriage. In fact, we were surprised that in many districts, young people were not able to tell us their caste. They don't know their caste name. They know whether it's general or SC. They can tell us whether they're general or SD, but they can't actually tell you the caste name. They'll go and ask their parents. So what does this mean for the awareness of caste? What does this mean for the social formation of caste, its relation to marriage, um, is a question we, I don't think we should rush to conclusion from our um, study. Uh, but we, uh, it is something I wish to flag for to take further. The second is that in, in South 24 Parganas, particularly, this is not true of all districts to the same extent, um, that even intercaste marriages nowadays, even arranged marriages are sometimes intercaste. So the hold of caste and the um, uh, significance of caste endogamy is probably um, not gone, certainly, but eroding in, even in the countryside. And if that is so, if there is a certain erosion of caste endogamy, then il caste itself should not be a major um, push towards for uh, intercaste marriage should not be the only reason why young people elope. And indeed, in our finding, we found many non-intercaste, I mean, children, young people marrying within their own caste also um, elope. Uh, so that is an, another interesting aspect which uh, uh, remains open. Uh, I'm not rushing to a conclusion on that. Uh, but it is something we can discuss. I will stop there. Um, I will just say one last thing, which is that this pandemic seems to have given a spurt to all the, the decline in child marriage, which had been noticed in many um, parts of the country, um, in most parts of the country, now seems to be suffering a little reversal. There is a spurt in child marriage at the time of the pandemic. It's being reported by journalists from across the country, including West Bengal. And this is a matter of considerable concern for policymakers. So, um, thank you so much, Professor Sen. Um, Onunna Dr. Gupta here on behalf of the, um, the, the women's um, cell. Um, Bishop Bharati, uh, I have the particular privilege of conducting the question answer session. It was um, riveting listening to listening to your talk, in particular the the revelation about um, the girl child as a concept and term having actually migrated, if you like, from India abroad rather than the other way around, and the the very interesting kind of instrumentality of uh, mobile telephony in the development of a certain kind of subjecthood and um, um, selfhood or uh, emotional empowerment in the case of um, girl children based in rural Bengal. And there was so much that uh, I guess I'm sure uh, there'd be a lot of questions. In fact, we can see two longish ones in the chat box. Would you prefer that I read them out? Um, 
would you like me to read out the questions? Not really. I can read it myself. But if okay. the people who are asking the questions wish to ask it, do they want to ask it? Yes. So, um, Professor Dr. Saikia, if you'd like to unmute yourself and maybe uh, put the question to the speaker directly. Um, she's inviting that you do so. But I'm not using microphone. Right. But Anunna, I think yes. uh, it would be better if you just you know, simply you know, read the question or paraphrase the question and ask it to Shomita because some of the participants may not have you know, connectivity. So I think it is better. You, you know, there are questions I can see in the chat box. Yeah. If you kindly read them and paraphrase the question, ask Shomita and let Shomita answer. Yeah, I can read the question. That's yeah. better, no? Maybe because in the most of the participants may not have you know, direct connectivity. The audio is not you know, always uh, clear enough. So you may have difficulty. So in that case, I'll uh, ask a request on Runa to paraphrase the question and uh, let you know. Okay. Thank you, so so I that. can read um, um, uh, Surja Saikia's question. So you don't need to read it out. Um, she, he is asking me whether there is a oh, difference in oh. South, North, West, and East part of India. Uh, there is. I mean, there is um, not all states in uh, India have the same. Um, uh, so there is, so when I said West Bengal has moved from number seven to number one, it means there is a ranking and the Bimaru, predictably the Bimaru states, the North and West states were higher in child marriage um, until this recent change in 2016 when West Bengal uh, uh, overtook. Rajasthan had very high rates of child marriage, which has declined also very dramatically. So Bihar, uh, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan had high rates of child marriage that has declined. South has always had lower rates of child marriage. Um, so yeah, there are these differences. But overall, South Asia has had historically had high rates of child marriage. That is also true. Northeast, which you haven't said here, um, has lower rates, but not Assam. So that's it. The Thank second you. question is on migration. Orpita Chatterjee is asking, as the migration of labor is, um, there is large scale migration, does, is it related to elopements? Um, we have found a lot of migration and it is an interesting question in terms of the, the talk um, uh, as a whole, uh, because that is in fact one of the major difference gender difference in adolescence because young boys migrate young girls don't migrate so much young girls also migrate but only for paid domestic work not only for mostly for uh, paid domestic work and they migrate within the state usually there is some migration out of state but not very much whereas Adolescent boys migrate for work, and this is both intrastate and interstate migration. It is even uh, sometimes international migration, not a very uh, large number, uh, but there is some. Uh, so that further adds to the contrast that I was making. If you add the fact that adolescent boys actually migrate out of the village altogether, then the fact that girls are held at home sharpens the contrast. Um, but it is also the case that some adolescent girls migrate for work. Uh, so add that to the mix. How it helps elopement, it is perhaps um, um, adolescent girls who migrate for paid domestic work, they usually are live-in domestic workers in urban areas. And that can lead to own choice, self-choice marriages. Perhaps not quite elopement, uh, but they do marry of their own choice in the city. Um, that is not uncommon. So in that sense, you could say that migration has a link with um, self-choice marriages. 
Um, Orpita is also asking, does the element of child marriage extend to absence of spouse? In so, Are you saying that um, the fact that the boy migrates that contributes to child marriage? I wouldn't think so. I haven't seen any evidence. Um, Shudipta Sharkar or Shudipto Sharkar, I don't know, is asking is it is an in um, the relationship between child marriage and paid domestic work. Okay, explain the relationship. The relationship is that in most, so child marriage has determined the um, what we call the life cycle workforce participation pattern. Um, in many countries of the world, women start working at a young age. Then they take, then they leave work in order to marry and have children. Then when their children are a little older, then they rejoin the workforce or they never jo join back in the workforce. This is a very common pattern of uh, women's workforce participation um, in China, Japan, even in Asia. It's not only in the West, even in Asia, it's a common pattern. South Asia has been a major exception. And we have uh, Professor Nirmala Banerjee's work which has shown that the woman worker in India is typically a married mother, by which she means that women marry first because it is child marriage. Um, there is no scope. If you're marrying at the age of 12 or 13, there is no scope to work before marriage. So first you marry. As soon as you are able to do anything, you marry. Then you have children, children grow up, and then if necessary, you join the workforce. That is the common pattern of women's workforce participation. In the case of paid domestic work alone, that we know of, uh, there is an exception. And that exception is because women, females, join paid domestic work at a very young age. The lowest that I have found is five years. So there is scope then for very young women to, to, to work as paid domestic workers prior to marriage. So this follows the pattern that you find elsewhere in the world. Women at the age of five, six, seven, 10, 11, they join paid domestic work, work for a few years, then they marry, and then they may or may not return to domestic work. So there is a connection with child marriage, but in the reverse direction. That is child marriage itself determines the way in which women's participation in paid domestic work happens. Okay, next question is Urna. Who is asking? Um, who is saying that I spoke of adolescent girls as a new, relatively new category in Bengali village? who are unique in that they have semi-independent access to a phone and internet media. What sort of media are popular among this demographic? And are there any that are demonized by the parents, elders of brainwashing the girls into immodest behavior? The popularity of TikTok lip sync dance videos among rural teenagers, for instance, has been documented over the past couple of years in our country. Exactly. Uh, so I can't actually tell you what the particular platforms are, uh, partly because our fieldwork was done in 2015, 16, that kind of time. Um, and uh, some of these platforms have changed and uh, 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 the popularity of TikTok has been relatively recent. Uh, 
um, and wasn't quite so evident uh, when we did our fieldwork. Uh, so yeah, I can't tell you the specific platform, specific softwares or what kind of um, 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 engagement became had become popular and it, internet connectivity was still in 2015 how, how quickly things change in this uh, regard is also you know you you it, it, it's a uh, it underlines for us um, how rapid the pace of change is in this um, field uh, so the, the internet connectivity was still uh, relatively low when we did our field work. So we can't, I can't comment on these specific um, 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 uh, platforms that you're talking about, TikTok in particular. Uh, but yes, the basic point that there was a gap of comprehension between generations in terms of what the internet meant, its content, its um, um, significance. Um, and this led to a complicated power dynamic because it was very clear to parents that this was empowering, that this, you know, this new technology was important, that access to this technology gave children a certain kind of command over knowledge and um, information, which typically in, in an earlier period, it's parents who had specialized information and knowledge. Uh, now children are getting specialized information and knowledge, which they are excluded from. And this affected the power dynamics of the family. Um, and this kind of power in the hands of young girls was quite a new thing for rural families. And um, you know, it would be wonderful if people followed up with more fieldwork and research um, on this uh, so that we could understand a little better um, how this, this change from inter intrafamilial dynamics is changing. Um, Professor Sen, if you'd like, if you'd allow me to intervene very briefly. Um, Professor Vipasha Raha seated next to me had a question and I believe Orpita Chatterjee who has posted a question already wishes to offer a clarification uh, about what she had asked. So would you like to take their questions and then- That would be great on? because yeah, I, I would love to have someone else talking. <laughs> for a change. So maybe yes, yes. we would like to speak. Uh, thank you, Professor Sen. Uh, brilliant as always. Uh, I have a small uh, query. Uh, when you talked about villages and you know this uh, this idea of elopement, I was just curious to know this. Uh, the observations on elopement, the figures, whatever conclusions you drew, that kind of thing. Uh, to what extent would that be community specific? I I'll make it clearer. Say for example, in Birbhum, in some of the villages, you have a strong Bihari population also. Now I have no, uh, I, I am not into this kind of stuff, I've never done it, but a little bit of curiosity has stemmed from the fact that many students are working on women. Now that is why I wanted to know that uh, there is Bihari, there is uh, Bengali populations over here. And in Midnapur also, another thing that is, there's a lot of Odia population. So uh, how do this, I mean, uh, is it the uh, same or uh, there is differences, elopement more common among Biharis. You see, I found out uh, from a little bit of questioning that uh, the, the marriages among Biharis, they have this, uh, uh, idea of getting grooms for girls from Bihar, you know, from the Desh. So these uh, girls who have been brought up in this kind of a culture, they are not really very willing to go back to that kind of Desh which they have no idea about. So uh, this uh, idea of elopement is more uh, attractive for them. And of course, mobile phone, I do agree, it has caused a lot of empowerment, you know, it's empowering them. That is one question I have, and I would like to know your observations on this. And second uh, thing that I would like to know is that uh, 
these kind of elopement, to what extent does this uh, result in some kind of trafficking? Because uh, uh, there is a tendency, I have found out that these young girls getting married, staying somewhere, say around Bhubondanga somewhere, getting married to boys, you know, uh, in spite of the uh, uh, disapproval of the family to boys from Rampurhat, you know, I don't know what, how they come to know one another, that kind of things are always there. And then you find that they are moving to Mumbai, the mother-in-law is living in Mumbai, that kind of ideas are there. So I would just like to have your observations on these few nice queries of mine. Absolutely. I mean, you're right on both counts. One is that um, there is this, um, uh, there is a, there are multiple trafficking um, strands here. Uh, so one, when you talk about Biharis, not only Biharis, but UP and Haryana, um, there is a uh, traffic of brides. So uh, agents come to West Bengal villages and buy wives, buy brides and take them to Bihar, to uh, Haryana, to Western UP. And sometimes they are never heard of again. Uh, what exactly this means? What kind of network? Um, we have heard, we've seen from Prem Chaudhary's work, Ravinder Kaur's work, that uh, sometimes these girls are held in, uh, they are wives in a manner of speaking, but they're held in conditions of near slavery. Sometimes they are sold on uh, to sex work. So there is, there are, and then there are clear cut trafficking. There are people who pick up girls and then sell them to into sex work. And my own work as a historian, um, I have shown in many of my uh, papers uh, that this is true from the 19th century, that women are recruited for work and then sold into various kinds of things. It could be, you know, in an earlier period, Assam tea gardens, they could be shipped off to other island colonies, they could be sold into sex work. The connection between recruitment and trafficking for girls, for women, has always been very interconnected. And that remains the case. Um, and things like, so elopement as a uh, way in which trafficking happens, um, girls are taken, they're killed. We have encountered cases like this in the process of our field work. Um, there is no doubt it happens. This is why I said that elopements are risky for girls. So girls cannot be sure that the man they're eloping with will be necessarily. And this mobile phone connection, you, girls even run away with men they barely know. Um, so it is a risky business. There are interfaces with trafficking. Um, and in fact, if you're looking at it from the perspective of trafficking, uh, then it is this spirit of adventure, this thirst for um, um, access to, you know, urban spaces, glamour, uh, all the things that the media brings to their homes, um, that in fact is the trafficker's most powerful weapon. They don't have to kidnap these girls, they have to seduce these girls, attract, tempt these girls. So yes, I mean, marriage, trafficking, elopement, all these are very, very closely entangled. Thank you for asking that question. I think it's a very important dimension of this whole issue. Um, thank you, Professor Sen. Before we return to the questions in the chat box, and I can see that very many have come in since, at least five and there are three, on top. Uh, Orpita Chatterjee requests me to read out can her I, clarification. Can I have a question, please? Um, yes, of course. Um, can we? Can I have a question, please? Yes. Um, may we know who's speaking? Because we cannot see you. Would you like to identify yourself and maybe post 
pose your question over your microphone. Hello, are you there? Um, so I, the gentleman will probably come back on. And while we wait, uh, this is Porpita Chatterjee's question, slightly rephrased. Where, uh, where is the husband go away to work for longer days or in cases where they do, in instances where they do, their extended absence makes uh, the wives seek company, the company of other men. In this context, is there any kind of connection between child marriage, migration, and elopement? That was uh, what she'd like to know. So you're asking whether married, uh, young married women elope. That has always been the <laughs> young married women elope. Again, I mean, historically, if you look, then um, and especially in the context of arranged marriage, unhappy marriages, um, it doesn't have to be migrant husbands. Uh, you don't necessarily, it, our family system is such that marital families, in fact, keep quite close eye on young brides. So it's not easy to look. It is not easy to, to enter another extramarital relationship. But if there is, and there always are, romance and love is you know, not a new thing. Um, and yeah, there's always elopement. That, but it, these are very, these are not, this is not a social trend. There has always been these things and there continue to be these things, but they are very infrequent occurrences. So I guess it's time to get back to the chat box and I can see three questions lined up from the top. Uh, beginning with uh, Dr. Nimai Chandra Shah's question about whether, how, what kind of measures we can take to stop child marriage, particularly in marginalized families. And there's another one by Professor Hem Kusum, followed by Devot Kamakosh, before we scroll down. Yeah, no, um, uh, how do we stop child marriage in marginalized families is, in fact, what the, 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 the whole weight of the literature on child marriage. That is what I wanted to convey with that very brief comment I made about shift from culture to development. So if you look at child marriage debates in the 19th and 20, early 20th century in colonial India, who were discussing child marriage? People like you and me, my, I mean, take Rabindranath, <laughs> take the Tagore family. Uh, all marriages in that generation were child marriages. All the girls were married at about seven to 10 years age, right? And to men much older than them. So the men were 20 plus, 20 plus and the girls were eight, six, seven, eight. So it is the elite at that time who practiced child marriage. And the change in that social system happened slowly and with enormous controversy. Culture, tradition, Hinduism, what will happen? What, what, what will happen if you know girls are not married at puberty? Um, um, ancestors will not get water, this, that, and the other religion, culture, tradition. It was accompanied by huge controversy. Then from the middle of the 20th century, the elite accepted adult marriage. Slowly age of marriage rose. By 1940s, there was hardly any girl in elite families who did not go to school. And therefore hardly any girl in elite families, middle-class families who married below the age of you know, 17, 16, 17, 18, adolescent girls. So once the middle classes accepted adult marriage, the question of culture, tradition, religion, all that somehow vanished. Now it's a question of the poor and the poor don't have culture, tradition and all that. Then it becomes a problem of poverty. 
And now it has to be, we know it is good. Now we know, now that we have no longer do child marriage, we know it is bad to do child marriage. And now we tell poor people that it is bad to do child marriage and you must do adult marriage. So this transition in the discourse of child marriage is an important transition to map. And for us to understand that we are imposing on the poor in the name of development, in something that we ourselves took a century <laughs> to change. Uh, so that I would, you know, I would flag um, that kind of um, class dimension to child marriage as an important corrective to how we think we do good to others. Uh, more self-awareness in our policy and uh, development perspectives. Yeah, so that would be my answer. To Hem Kushum's question, um, that is a more complicated question. Um, and one of the um, uh, dimensions of my examination of elopements is precisely what you say, that if child marriage, for when we talk about eliminating child marriage, our target is not the child. Our target is the parents. We are telling parents not to marry of their children. Now, in our course, uh, in the course of our field work, we met many parents who said, we don't want our children to marry, but they're eloping and marrying. What are we supposed to do? So who then looking at elopements further complicates the whole agenda of stopping child marriage. If children themselves wish to marry, then what, and there are two very, strongly competing discourses on this. If you look at Kanyashri and the Kanyashri club and the fact that you are getting reports in newspapers every other day that, you know, children are girls are going to the police, are going to local administration to prevent their parents marrying them off. So there is on there are both stories. There is the adolescent girl resisting child marriage when it comes from parents. And then there is the adolescent girl seeking child marriage on her own behalf through elopements. You have two adolescent girls doing exactly the opposite things. Um, and you, you have to take both into account in terms of understanding this social process and understanding its policy implication. That would be my point. And I would take both into account. I would not necessarily say one is, you know, uh, better than the other. Um, there's a long question from Devottama about girl child dropping out class 10, whether there could be a biological uh, foundation to that trend. Yes, I mean, that is this, that is precisely the point. It's like the age 15 is a convergence of biological age, class eight, marriage. And this has been the whole culture story. The culture story is that in Hindu, um, um, both in Hindu and Islam, because in Islam also 15 is supposed to be Sharia's age of marriage, um, that both in Hinduism and Islam, um, there is a social sanction that girls should be married at puberty, immediately after puberty or at puberty or immediately before puberty. So there's a clear link. And this is not something that is Indian. New, if you look at um, um, new research on marriage is happening everywhere in the world. And if you look, for instance, there is a whole story of child marriage in the United States. 
Um, and uh, there are campaigns and all that against child marriage in the United States also. Um, uh, Southern European countries also have a history of early marriage. Uh, so many parts of the world, this convergence, this, this is a very, um, this is a not, this is a clear intuitive link between puberty and marriage. Um, and um, yeah, it is, there is a convergence in this, what the social um, uh, re demand of our time is that we raise the age of marriage far beyond this. Now, this will only work if there is an alter that that is, in a sense, my point that it, this you can raise the age of marriage only if you have an alternative in place. And this has to be what? Either education or work. In the absence of either education or work, there will be a pressure either from parents or from the girls themselves to enter into marriage. I and marriage is an occupation for women, especially in Bengal. <laughs> this is the only, it is the passage, the, the rite of passage to adulthood. I think we need to scroll up again to uh, an earlier questions. I, I should think that uh, there's a question from Shutapa Mukherjee about uh, the anomaly between um, West Bengal having quite a bit of access for uh, girl children to secondary education and yet kind of reflecting um, rather dismal uh, figures when it comes to child marriage. As you said, it's number one on the league table. So yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that is, uh, we have to, um, so the, it, it's interesting that in 2016, um, the National Family Planning Survey uh, led to its revision. Ranking revision happened. Then no, they said, no, 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 mistake. West Bengal is not number one. Um, then again, they said, no, no, West Bengal is number one. That is actually not so important. Um, but yes, we need to look at whether the recent, that is why I said the impact. See, the, the really important thing here is that the uh, decline in child marriage in other states like Rajasthan, Bihar, where child marriage incidence of child marriage was higher than West Bengal earlier, the decline happened because of targeted schemes. And there was no scheme in West Bengal until Kanyashri was introduced in 2014. That is very, very important that for the first intervention in child marriage through a targeted scheme in West Bengal happened only in 2014. So in 2016, clearly we won't see any impact. Uh, but now in 2021, after several years of Kanyashri, there might be an impact. So we do need to do a uh, very, um, um, you know, a focused field work to look at whether there has been an impact of Kanyashri. A lot of comments have come in uh, by way of thanking you for your, uh, for your insights. So a um, lot of laudatory comments, but I suppose since time is short, and let me also reiterate uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor's words. If at any point you feel that you're exhausted answering um, the, the the questions that are coming in, do do let us know and we can, we can pause. Um, I think there's a question by Shudipta Dash uh, about the role played by peers in perhaps. Uh, uh, a, a positive role, a constructive role in stopping child marriage. So maybe your response to that. Absolutely. I mean, that is the idea behind the Kanyashi Club. And we also had another initiative by the police in uh, South 24 Parganas, which was called Swayam Sithya, in which I was involved in 2016, 15, 16, 17. 
uh, which also tried to do this, to mobilize peer groups in order to uh, prevent trafficking. Um, and I do think peer group influence for adolescents is very important. It has a, a much um, um, higher impact uh, and direct impact than trying to do this through adults. Um, and uh, uh, Kanyashi clubs have had enormous success in preventing child marriage when the girl doesn't wish to enter child marriage. So yeah, I think um, um, I would endorse that position. Right. Um, I can see a question from Sudev Basu about uh, the possibilities of reading, you know, ethnic religious denominations into the kind of picture that you are you're coming up with in terms of incidents and occurrences. Yeah. I mean, there is. I mean, there is a very strong um, uh, overlap that elopements, intercommunity marriages, often happen through elopements, and that. The sanction against inter-community marriage is much higher than the sanction against inter-caste marriage, at least in our experience through this seven district fieldwork. Uh, in South 24 Parganas, where caste is much looser, uh, um, uh, caste endogamy is not so strongly um, imposed. Inter-community mar marriage has much stronger sanction. And still you do have intercommunity marriage. In our field work, we found some cases of intercommunity marriage, mostly through elopements. No, oh, all of them through elopements. Um, and, but some very successful. Some where parents have accepted and um, things are okay and you know it's settled down. Uh, some are more complicated. Some have led to regret. Um, so you have all the whole spectrum there. I think we are um, we are done with the questions. Um, I had a small one, if I may uh, exercise, perhaps, um, or have the the privilege finally. So I was wondering about the de desertion as a by husbands. Uh, is there any kind of correlation in terms of? Uh, desertion being more common where uh, where girl childs marry early and get, don't get an idea about or uh, are not in a position to form particularly full comprehensive idea about whom they are marrying so um, because most of the people who come to work for us uh, domestic helpers even around Shantiniketan and Bolpur um, uh, I can vouch for um, my helpers too they are the women who have been deserted after after bearing child, and so uh, they have been single mothers, quarters, and so on. So, is there any kind of any kind of uh, trajectory there between child marriage and the incidence of desertion by husbands? Um, um, your nar the narrative as you said it the link is really between desertion and domestic worker yes perfect. so it is much more likely that a woman who's been deserted it will seek work um, and since work is very limited in the west bengal context a very large proportion of them seek domestic work so your um, sample there is kind of self-selected. So you will have a high, higher proportion of deserted women among domestic workers. Whether child marriage leads to more desertion is much more difficult to establish because we don't have, um, um, this is almost, we don't have the quantity, <laughs> the data to um, establish a quantitative correlation. Um, in terms of the qualitative data, I have tried to look at domestic violence within child marriage. And um, what we find is that there are two major um, factors in um, domestic violence. And child marriage perhaps isn't one of them. One is dowry, which is predictable, 
Uh, so disagreements between marital and uh, uh, natal family about transactions, sometimes not strictly speaking dowry, but demands that uh, a husband or his family makes of the bride's family, which are, if they are not met, then that leads to domestic violence. And domestic violence can lead to desertion or to the breakup of the marriage. The man doesn't desert as much as the girl deserts and girl leaves in such circumstances. Um, so no, I can't um, see from the material we have collected that we can make a direct relationship between desertion and child marriage. I, child uh, early marriage i mean there is very little by way of child marriage but early marriages are that is the normal form of marriage most girls in the village will marry before 18. so it is more normal to marry before 18 than to marry after 18. so when you say early marriage you're talking about the bulk of marriage so if you're then beginning to relate it to desertion, then whatever your relationship between marriage and desertion is, is the relationship. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Yes. So um, you can see from the number of questions how, uh, how absorbing the session has been. Um, I believe we... If, if you'd be agreeable, there is one last question from Professor Asha Mukherjee. Uh, uh, would Professor Mukherjee like to unmute in herself and uh, speak? Yes. Uh, thank you, Shavita, for a wonderful talk. Um, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, uh, I was just wondering, you know, I mean, like, even now, I think, uh, not in the elite class, perhaps, any, not so much perhaps, but even today, a girl child is born to go from the home. So actually, the whole concept of a girl child is basically a child which is really born as a burden. A child which has to leave uh, the family uh, either as a, as a, you know, I mean, the poor uh, families as a as a child which is underfed uh, due to some kind of disease or at the at the age as you've said you know the adolescent girl uh, even to reach that point even even today in the poor families is a really a kind of blessing uh, uh, if a child really grows up to that point so uh, you know I mean uh, with the, all sides of social stigma still continues and in such situation, the child, uh, uh, the girl, girl child, which actually re reaches up to eight, now that at least she has the possibility of going to the school, uh, uh, even then, you know, it's hardly, I mean, in very, very rare cases, the children are really enjoying and they want to study due to Kannashi or whatever opportunities they have, uh, they reach to a certain uh, stage. And the social pressure is so much that they have to leave. They have to leave anyway, you know. So uh, at the age of 15, 16, 14, uh, you know, I mean, they, they really look for a, an opportunity. So elopement, which you have talked so much in your talk, perhaps is due to that reason, that this whole social stigma, that the child is actually brought up with the concept that she will have to leave the family. She is not part of the family. And she is actually, you know, in a kind of transition. You know, she has to find out a place. And even in the married uh, marriage place, I mean, married uh, family where she goes, she has so much difficulty to adjust herself. She's not really wanted even there. So very often she has so much problems. She really do not know where to go. She's having all sorts of problems and still she has to keep on adjusting. And even there, she has to leave at some point. Now this, you know, I'm not having her home, her own home, uh, uh, even in the, I mean, like the property rights, for example, they are just on the papers. I mean, you don't find property, uh, women owning the property, neither at parents' place 
nor at the, at the husband's place. So even in the educated middle classes, I've seen in among my own students, even they are serving, they are using, they are working at the universities. Still, they have no say regarding their property. They are earning, their money is not their own money. They have to give it to the family. So I think it's a terrible situation. And in that kind of situation, I mean, the elopement perhaps is, in any case, it's a risk for the child, right? From the day one, when she's born, she knows she has to you know, uh, uh, leave. So whatever comes, she just jumps as an elopement. So, I mean, how do you explain? How do you look at this situation? And uh, uh, how do we take care of such kind of mentality, which is actually rooted in the social system? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great pleasure, Asha, to hear you, even if I can't see you. Um, <laughs> lovely to have you here today. Um, but yeah, I mean, you are right on every count. There is nothing I can say very much in response. Hi, how are Hi. you? <laughs> so yeah, no, you are absolutely, uh, that is the point in a sense, that is the bigger point, which is at the back of my, um, right. um, uh, many of my comments, that child marriage by itself is not the problem. Yeah. The problem is the marriage system itself. The problem you will not buy what what will what is if we are taking a legal definition of child marriage what difference does it make if a girl is 17 or 18 when she marries will it make any difference to her life if it doesn't make any difference to her life so far as she is concerned what is the problem with child marriage yeah so we have to think about child marriage in the context of an asymmetric, universal, compulsory marriage system, a marriage system in which it is the 99% the of people marry. Right. It is assumed that everybody will marry. Girls have to marry. There is no other future. Exactly. There is no imagination of a future for a girl other than marriage. If you have to marry, you have not only have to marry, you have to be the husband, the groom has to be paid to marry you uh, in, in the form of dowry. Then you have already devalued that girl to the point where all the things you describe become true. Um, so yeah, I mean, marriage, the problem is that not child marriage, the problem is marriage itself and the marriage system and the marriage, the gender asymmetry within which this marriage system happens, proliferates um, and all that. Um, within that, we, given, given the, the, the gender asymmetry and all the problems, within that elopement, That is why I said is elopement, my question is, what is my political question with elopement? I'm not assuming that elopement is emancipatory. Yeah. Elopement is one way in which young people are exercising a certain kind of agency. If you ask the question of whether elopement marriages after marriage are different from arranged marriages, the answer in 90% cases is no, they're the same. Right. So is this merely an adjustment in the marriage system where you allow some self-choice marriages and everything else remains the same? If everything else remains the same, then the value or the gain from elopements will be very small indeed. It's some gain in that people choose their own partners, but it's small. If indeed this from this small beginning, more change does happen. If there is change in the marriage system as a result, the, I, th I would say what is important, why this is a good research question is because it is, we need to compare different communities in which elopements are accepted. 
and this is why West Bengal is an interesting case because with West Bengal seem to be accepting elopements as a social change. And we need to understand why certain societies accept it and why some, some societies don't. Um, and if it does, then if number of elopements, if self-choice marriages increase um, substantially so as to then make a dent in the marriage system, that would be interesting. That would be a direction, a, a point in the right direction. And this is in the context of our research. But the bigger point you're making about the whole of society, I would say that one child families among the middle classes nowadays in our generation as parents, where you have only one child and the child is a daughter, their things are changing because these daughters then do inherit property. And they not only inherit property, they inherit property from working fathers and mothers. So this is a concentration of capital that is happening at in the middle classes. And that is, we don't know the, what the implications of that social change will be. Because only once these girls start, you know, uh, uh, becoming adults and they are already adults, but when they start exercising social power, then we'll know what the implications of this is. I'm not so pessimistic. I see some social change. Sure, there are some social changes, for sure. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Sen. It's been an extraordinary hour and a half and maybe a little longer and we could have gone on really. Um, but it's time that I uh, handed over uh, the session um, to and the house to uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor who will have some concluding remarks, I suppose, and uh, also would like to deliver the, the, his words of thanks. But before I do so, uh, there's a permission to seek. Uh, would you agree to your talk being uploaded to our Vishwabharati YouTube channel? Is there, would you have any objection to that? No, I'm okay. Thank you very much indeed. So over to uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor now. Thanks for, so much. You know, Thank Arunta, you. The first of all, as I, I keep saying that in this university, everybody is honorable. So when you add this, you know, prefix before me, I feel little, you know, uh, defeated. So I think my request to you next time Please don't use this. I mean, I'm just one of you. Munna me bole khato ho, ami tawa deri log, ami tawa deri log, ami tawa deri. And I strongly believe in this. And I'm sure Shomita will endorse my point of view. And uh, Shomita knows me for quite, for I think more than three decades. So I think she also will endorse that I, you know, enjoy being one of my colleagues. Um, uh, Shomita, now I have got the formal. Uh, kind of word of thanks because I remember, you know, I learned it from our vice president, um, probably honorable vice president, uh, Mr. Venkaya Naidu, when I uh, said that we will offer vote of thanks, he said, no, no, it's word of thanks. And I think that's an appropriate word. So now it's my pleasant duty to extend a uh, vote of thanks, uh, not vote of thanks, but uh, word of thanks. But I'm just, you know, I'm a little curious, uh, Shobita, since you uh, presented before us, you know, who are part of Vishwabharati, um, I am reminded of uh, the history because given your training in history, um, I just would like to place it before you. You don't have to answer. If you can answer, that would be great. Um, you know, if you look at um, the historical texts, there are many um, radical thinkers uh, who question child marriage. Uh, who raised uh, very radical feminist issues. Yet, when it came to practice, they invariably surrendered you know, to the prevalent social practices. You know, I have in mind Keshav Chandra Shen, for instance. I have in mind Devendra Thakur, for instance. You know, at one level, they were radical you know, famine, feminists. And also Rabindran Tagore, because you know, if you look at his text, uh, whether you talk of... Uh, Gora, you know, Shucharita, uh, or you talk of um, Ela, 
uh, or you talk of you know uh, bimola you know these are all radical uh, women characters but at the same time rabindranath when he came to uh, marrying his daughter you know she didn't talk about this in you know, a child marriage issue so i i'm just wondering that despite having held all the radical notions about uh, women liberation feminist issues well, they were constrained by social uh, circumstances so do you agree with that view that now the society has progressed so much and uh, that's why we are uh, strong enough we are uh, quite you know radical enough to articulate our views and put it before the public domain so do you link uh, the ideas of radical social changes with you know the existing social economic and uh, political situation that's just you know out of curiosity um, out of curiosity Um, well i would i would, could answer that question with yeah, an intro with if you with please, uh, very briefly like me, if you please i'm i'm working brief. on i'm working on you know uh, three tagores now you know dwarkanath and devendranath and robindranath and you know i i i am drawn into their ideas but when it came to practice i mean keshav shen is a radical example you know he she, he talked about all kinds of radical views when it came to uh, his daughter's marriage he didn't bother about the age of consent bill so i mean uh, you know i'm just saying the why this contradiction how will you explain this kind of contradiction as a historian so as a historian i would say two things i would say first that uh, we are talking about a period in which um child marriage marriage was universal and indeed child marriage was not universal perhaps but certainly universal among the elite so radical social change happens by first thinking about it before you do before radical social change happens you have to visualize it you have to envision it um and i think these thinkers i debendronath i don't think really spoke against child marriage but keshav shen certainly was a major contradictory figure in this regard because he was instrumental in passing that law mm. which fixed the age of marriage at 14 and then went a few <laughs> within a few years uh, married his daughter at pillo which led to the schism in the brahmo samaj so it's a very important political event uh, rabindranath certainly as the person who wrote such i mean way beyond his time in his thinking about women um and then goes and marries his daughters you know at such young ages um in rabindranath's case this contradiction between what he wrote and what he did is particularly also particularly stark and i would explain that by saying that in fact it is very it is difficult to do things against the grain of your own social time it is perhaps easier to think it so you are the daughter father of a daughter in our time when it is impossible when the social norm has changed to an extent where child marriage is considered a bad thing to do could you marry your child your daughter when she was before you know 18 mm-hmm. um so but it is a bad thing so this is a you know not a fair question mm-hmm. um but um, yeah i mean it is always much more difficult to do things in your time which are um against the grain of of um social practice than it is to write but we will still remain grateful to those radical thinkers who wrote radical things it has remained for the future a huge resource for us so i would negate neither i would not say that that should they should be forgiven for not following through with their ideas but nor will i devalue what they have written i think though the, what they wrote in that time eventually helped us overcome um some of these things so i um, i understand that child marriage is as 
I said in response to Asha's question, that child marriage by itself is not our problem. The problem is the marriage system. But at the same time, I'm not saying that child marriage is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think for women, um, ma marrying young, I mean, marriage, as I have shown with my life, marriage is perhaps not a good thing for women at all. Uh, but if you were to marry, I wouldn't recommend you doing so at, as a child. Thank you. Thank you, Shavita. Um, formally, uh, we uh, thank you on behalf of Vishwabharati Puribar. And uh, I also compliment my colleagues in Women Association because of their hard work. Um, they could get you to give us a talk despite you being physically away from us and also academically terribly uh, inundated with many, many things to uh, shoulder. So uh, uh, with these words, Shomita, bhalo theko, shabdhana theko, karan England dao kindu COVID baat chhe, be careful, amra ek to valar bhele je aachi, se yunna injection ki nicho, vaccine ki nicho? Acta, acta. Amiya acta nicho vaccine, so then shabdhana theko, and I wish you all the best. And it I actually I am to 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 lecture Probably uh, at your convenience sometime. Um, uh, once you are relatively little free from your uh, daily uh, work, academic work, teaching and research, if you kindly tell us about your joot work, because I am I, I knew when it was being you know. Uh, revised uh, as a book. So I was a little associated with your projects and I, I know it's a very fascinating kind of work after Dipesh Das work on um, working class history. So if you kindly you know, give us a date uh, according to convenience, sometime in September, October. Um, and, and if you happen to be in India, in uh, most probably during Puja, you plan to come down, no? Okay. Yeah. So then September, October, if you give us the time, we can have this online lecture on your, on your PhD topic and on your uh, topic on the book, because that's very fascinating kind of work, friends, because I re read it when it was being revised um, as a book. And I'm told, I mean, I can you know, vouch for that, that it is one of the best work on uh, women workers in Bengal jute industry. So I think, Shobita, if you can you know, give us time, we'll be really grateful to you. And... All of you. Stay Thank safe, you. stay Thank well. You. Thank you. Thank you, Shamita. Thank you.